the late Andy Warhol, the American social critic and film producer, is the one who uttered the words. You're familiar with them. You've heard them quoted many times. Decades ago, Warhol said, in the future, everybody will get their 15 minutes of fame. Well, if Warhol is correct, and certainly in this social media age, he does seem to have been, then Simon of Cyrene is about to get his 15 minutes of fame. Simon is going to be in the right place at the right time, or, depending on your perspective, the wrong place at the wrong time to get his fame. He makes a cameo appearance in the Gospel account. He makes his cameo appearance right at the end of Christ's life. He's an eyewitness. He's an involuntary eyewitness and participant. As you know, we're on this journey, journey toward Calvary, toward the empty tomb, and just beyond, a journey called Eyewitness, first-hand stories from Christ's passion. And today, it's Simon. Simon's cameo appearance in the gospel is told in one verse. One verse. That's it. Now, it's true, his name appears in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It doesn't appear in John. And in each of those synoptic gospels, his story is one verse long. So you might wonder, why do we spend time then with Simon? Such a brief encounter. Well, Warhol said everybody gets their 15 minutes. Maybe this is Simon's 15 minutes of fame. And after all, Simon is an eyewitness. And there's something powerful, something compelling about an eyewitness account. Just ask Abe. Abe was an eyewitness. That day was an exciting day in Abe's life. He took his camera. He was excited to have it. He made his way down to the place where he knew the event was supposed to unfold, and he was ready with his camera. In fact, he tried two or three different places, two or three different angles or spots. He wanted to be at the best possible one. He finally found the one that he thought would be the best, and he got ready for the moment, for the event that was going to happen. Little did he realize that he would be an eyewitness to one of the most pivotal events in history, certainly in American history. The Liddy realized that the 26 seconds of film that he would record would be spoken of later as the most important 26 seconds of film in history. Filmed with his Bell & Hal 8mm camera, he was there, Abe was, filming when it happened. The unthinkable, the unimaginable happened. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dealey Plaza. And it would be Abe, Abraham Zapruder's film, now known simply as the Zapruder film, that would record the events that unfolded. His 15 minutes of fame... Oh, he got that and then some. His film continues to be discussed and dissected to this very day and time. He was an eyewitness and his camera captured the moment. There's power in an eyewitness account. Just ask Elias, Elias Lopez. I had the privilege of interviewing Elias when we were in our sanctuary. Remember those days when we were worshiping there? This was years ago. Elias was a young man. In fact, Elias had studied here in Loma Linda at Loma Linda Academy. It was some years after graduating from Loma Linda Academy that he got his start in professional life. And this moment was an exciting day for him, an exciting moment for him. It was his second day of orientation at Morgan Stanley. You can imagine how a young man in the business world feels, finally have my foot in the door, finally things are starting to happen, I'm excited to be on board, eager to learn what I need to do. And so it was on that day, September 11, 2001, that Elias was in the Morgan Stanley office on the 61st floor of the South Tower of the Twin Towers, Manhattan, New York City. 
He said that when they looked out the window and they saw the swirling shredded paper blowing in the wind, at first they thought, is there a confetti parade today? But that didn't make sense. Soon the announcement came, evacuate the building. They started down. There was some confusion at first, back up and down again. But then the command was clear, evacuate the building. He, along with many others, were making their way down the stairwell from the 61st floor when the second plane hit the second tower. It rocked the tower. Elias would share with us that he was knocked down with others, knocked down two flights of stairs. But he made it out, made it out into the plaza where the bodies of the jumpers were crashing into the pavement. I spoke with Elias's mother a couple of days after 9-11, had known her since my teenage years in Guadalajara, Mexico, spoke with her. She had been, as you might imagine, on pins and needles at first, but he called her. She would say to me, Dr. Vivian Hakimian Lopez, she would say to me, he doesn't have a scratch on him, but emotionally, he's totally gone. That's the reality of an eyewitness moment, the power that it has. So we're listening to the eyewitnesses. You think of them. Abraham Zapruder, Elias Lopez, Simon of Cyrene. Now it's Simon's turn. Now it's Simon's moment. Now we look at the scene through Simon's eyes. So there are two pathways that converge in Simon's moment in his 15 minutes of fame. Two pathways. One is the pathway of Jesus. The other is the pathway of Simon. So first, the pathway of Jesus. Jesus has arrived at this moment in time through a brutal series of events. Just in these past hours, he has endured, if you can call them that, six trials. Three religious, three civil. He's been to see Annas, and then to Caiaphas, then to the Sanhedrin and then to Pilate, and then to Herod, and then back to Pilate. He finally has been convicted and condemned and sentenced to die, and now the moment has come. Now, it would be helpful to have an accurate picture in our minds of just what this moment would have been like in the pathway and the journey of Jesus. So listen to the words of New Testament scholar David Garland as he describes such moments. Garland writes, Execution of condemned criminals was a public affair. Wells comments, The Romans had a highly developed and theatrical sense of the public ceremonial. The triumph was one aspect of it, and the soldiers had given Jesus a mock triumph. Crucifixion was another facet of it. This horrible means of execution served two purposes. One, it punished the criminal by prolonging the pain for as long as possible. Victims could linger on crosses for days as they slowly died from asphyxiation from muscle fatigue. Two, the public exposure served also as a warning and a deterrent. The victim was paraded through the streets with a placard announcing the crime and was then hanged on a cross strategically placed beside well-traveled roads. His torment would then strike fear into the hearts of those who happened to pass by. During the first revolt against Rome, those caught by the Romans trying to sneak away from the besieged Jerusalem to forage for food were crucified next to the walls of the city. According to Josephus, the Roman general Titus, and now these words are drawn from Josephus, hoped that the spectacle might perhaps induce the Jews to surrender for fear that continued resistance might involve them in a similar fate. 
The soldiers, out of rage and hatred, amused themselves by nailing their prisoners in different postures, and so great was their number that space could not be found for the crosses nor crosses for the bodies. That's Roman execution. That's Jesus' destiny. On this dastardly, fateful Friday, of Passover. That's the pathway that has brought him to this moment in time. But there's one more piece in his pathway, and that is that he falls under the burden of the cross, stumbles, staggers, falls. The Gospel writers don't tell us why, but it doesn't take much to imagine why. Jesus had been beaten, and he had been scourged. The Roman scourge was a dreaded punishment. In fact, the truth is, many prisoners, many convicted criminals, did not survive the Roman scourge. They died before they ever got to the place of execution. So it's not hard to imagine that Jesus, having been bereft of water and of food, having spent the kind of night that he spent after his agony in Gethsemane, and then after the capture, the beating, the torture, the scourging, he couldn't stand up under the load. What typically happened was this. The prisoner on his way to the place of execution carried the cross beam, not the entire cross, contrary to artistic renditions. Normally, that's what happened. The cross beam, the patibulum, was loaded on the criminal's shoulders to carry. It usually weighed about 100 pounds. And Jesus, due to all that had happened and due to the weight, staggered and fell. And now the Roman guard, these legionnaires, these, these fighters, these warriors who are used to having anyone obey their command, have a problem. Who's going to carry the cross? Certainly they're not going to do it. And that's where the second pathway, the first pathway is the pathway, pathway of Jesus. The second pathway is the path, pathway of Simon. That's where the two pathways converge. He's about to get his 15 minutes. Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene was a city in northern Africa, in the part of Africa that today is known as Libya. We don't know much at all about Simon, and so much is conjecture. But the scholars and the commentaries tend to fall in the same patterns and lines because the pieces of the puzzle that we do have cause us to move towards certain conclusions. It's possible that Simon was already a citizen of that area of the world around Jerusalem, and that he was just coming in for the Passover from out, maybe working in the fields. That's a possibility. It is, however, more likely that he, as a Jewish person of African extraction in that other part of the world, had focused, as one New Testament theologian said, his life's hope and dreams on celebrating Passover in Jerusalem. Next year, in Jerusalem. It's very possible that this was the culmination of those hopes and of those dreams. So he comes from northern Africa, comes to the area around Jerusalem, and as the morning begins to warm up, he makes his way into the city of Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. And it is that moment, at that precise moment in time, that he encounters that macabre procession coming out of the city. Simon encounters it and is grabbed by the soldiers. Now, the technical terminology used in the original identifies a commandeering, a conscripting, something that these occupiers call the Roman guard, reserved the right to do with any of their Jewish underlings. They could just take over, say, you're doing this, and make the person do it. 
And that's what happened in the case of Simon. We're, we're going to read the one verse and a few verses later in Mark's Gospel, the 15th chapter, that tells the story. Mark 15, verse 21. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. Simon was conscripted, forced. In fact, Luke, of the three Gospels who tell the account, may be the most forceful in telling it. Luke says they seized him, seized him, and made him carry the cross. No choice here. This is happenstance, and it is involuntary. It's coincidental that Simon and the procession meet, and it's involuntary that he becomes a participant in the scene. So the question is, how did Simon feel about that? How did he react to it? What was his response? Did he take pride in it? Boast, brag, crow a little about? I was at the center of the crowd. I was at the center of the scene. Not likely. Not at all likely. Was he humiliated? Embarrassed? Did his hatred for the Romans increase? Was he bitter toward and did he despise this prisoner whose cross he was now bearing? How did Simon respond? Or, or did Simon have a change of heart? He had a change of direction because he was headed into the city for the Passover and they were headed out of the city to the hill. They grabbed him, turned him around, and headed him toward Golgotha. He had a change of direction, but did he have a change of direction? Was his life transformed by this moment? Let me be very clear and say, we don't know with certainty. But let me hasten to add that the pieces of the puzzle that come together rather strongly indicate that Simon's heart, Simon's life, was changed. So notice what happens. Notice that when Mark tells us the story in that one verse, cameo appearance, a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus. It's an interesting statement. Commentary after scholar underlines this reality. A writer doesn't write that kind of comment make that kind of brief assertion unless he's assuming that the readers know those names and know them well. doesn't do that. Which would give us to understand that the readers of Mark's Gospel know Alexander and Rufus. They may not know Simon. They may not know the previous generation. They may not know where Alexander and Rufus came from. But as Mark pens his Gospel, he says, Simon of Cyrene, by the way, guys, he's, he's Alexander and Rufus's dad. And they're like, oh, really? He was there. Is that so? So we take note of that. 
But then secondly, we take note of the fact that, again, scholars are largely almost completely agreed that Mark's gospel is based on Peter's account. In other words, Peter's the source, Mark is the writer. Further, that Mark's gospel was written from Italy, in Rome, and likely to the Roman church. That that's the context in which this is all unfolding. So, if that's the case, and it seems to be the case, then this Alexander and Rufus, who are known by the members of the church, are in Rome. Now, that's of interest because of another passage in Scripture. This one over in Romans, the 16th chapter. Romans 16 is being penned by that firebrand known as the Apostle Paul, the great apostle of the Gentiles. He's writing to his friends in Rome, hoping that he will be able to come and join them soon. And at the end of the letter, the last chapter, he's sending greetings to the different members of the Roman church, people that he knows. And at one point in that list, he says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, whose mother is my mother too. Now, just think about what Paul is saying. He's saying, this Rufus, his mother, and I, and Rufus, have such a tight, such a, a close relationship together that I can refer to her as not only Rufus's mother, but my mother, too. This is no passing acquaintance. This is a deep, close relationship. And then notice what he says about Rufus. He says, Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Now just linger with that for a moment. Because if, as appears to be the case, if this Rufus has a father named Simon of Cyrene, and if Simon met that procession, and had his 15 minutes of fame, and if Simon's life was changed by that, then the story of the gospel told throughout this book is happening here yet again. A happenstance encounter, an involuntary witness, who in that moment is transformed, and years later, maybe decades later, the outworking of that transformative experience are still being felt. It's as though Paul is saying, all the way back there, staggering under the burden of that patibulum, that cross beam on the way to Calvary, Rufus, God chose you. It's an amazing reality. It leads me to say our central thought for today through this eyewitness encounter is simply this. Christ's cross can transform involuntary happenstance into destiny. Christ's cross can transform involuntary happenstance into destiny. So maybe you have a question that I often have as I, as I read stories like this and try to sort through exactly what does this mean in my life. If you have those kinds of questions, I want to suggest three take-homes. Three simple take-homes. If it is true that Christ's cross can transform involuntary happenstance into destiny, how does that translate into my life? Three things. One, don't assume that happenstance is merely happenstance. Don't assume that happenstance is merely happenstance. It can be. Life is rough and tumble. Coincidences do occur. 
Happenstance does come our way, absolutely. But for the follower of Jesus, for the one viewing the crucifixion through the eyes of Simon, don't assume that happenstance is merely happenstance. Popular writer these days traces out the, those realities by saying those coincidences are moments when God winks. He's saying, I got you. You thought that was just coincidence? I'm watching. The one who sees the sparrow when it falls is watching your life. Don't assume that happenstance is merely happenstance. Somebody here as part of this worship service knows that. Because that person can look back to a college class. Maybe it was a math class. You got there a bit late. You had a couple of things that held you up. You walked in embarrassed to be late, looked around the room, saw only one seat, took that last seat. Just happened to be next to her. She had caught your eye before. But now, you're sitting there. You got to know her. And that budded and bloomed. And today, 45 years later, you have there in your home where your family pictures hang the same little plaque that my wife got and put where our family pictures appear. It simply says, all because two people fell in love. Don't assume happenstance is merely happenstance. Not when your life belongs to God. A second take home. Don't assume that an involuntary cross is the worst thing. Don't assume that an involuntary cross is the worst thing. We all carry crosses. That's the reality of life. In fact, we have a saying. When we refer to something difficult or challenging in our lives, we'll often say, that's just the cross I bear. Don't assume that an involuntary cross is the worst thing. It could be illness. It could be emotional brokenness. It could be addiction. It could be relational rupture, friendship fracture. It could be financial devastation. I don't know what it is, but somewhere in your life, there is a heavy cross that feels like it is torturing you. And the message of Simon is don't assume, don't automatically assume that an involuntary cross is the worst thing because I say that because I've talked to too many people over the years who discovered something quite different in the counseling office after a worship service a student in a classroom too many people who have said to me things like this that addiction broke me. It fractured me. But in that utter, total brokenness, Jesus found me. God rescued me. The Holy Spirit saved me. I walk a life of discipleship with Jesus now that I don't believe I ever would have experienced had it not been for that addiction. I've heard those stories over and over again. There are ways in my own journey which I could tell you the same story. So don't assume that an involuntary cross is the worst thing. Certainly, sometimes it is bad, no question. I am not here trying to redeem every illness, every damaging moment, every difficult experience and say they're all good for you, so just eat them just like you eat your broccoli. 
No, there is tragedy in the world. I fully understand that. All I'm saying is Simon may be telling us, don't assume that an involuntary cross is the worst thing. In a moment, a picture is going to appear on your screen. It's a picture that was taken when the movie The Passion of the Christ was being filmed. Mel Gibson's film of now probably almost 20 years ago. He is sitting in the picture you'll see in a moment, Mel Gibson alongside Jim Caviezel. Jim played Jesus in that cross. It's a moment when there was apparently a break in the filming and they sat and talked and, and Gibson was, I suppose, giving him directions as a producer. But the picture has made the rounds on Instagram and Facebook and it tends to contain captions like, Try telling Jesus your cross is too heavy. Or if we were to put it in the language of today's sermon, try telling Jesus that your involuntary cross is the worst thing. So here's the picture. How would you like to tell Jesus that your involuntary cross is the worst thing? Three take-homes. Don't assume that happenstance is merely happenstance. Don't assume that an involuntary cross is the worst thing. And thirdly, don't assume that a bad experience is your identity. Don't assume that a bad experience is your identity. Understand this experience that happened to Simon from the external, superficial perspective, terrible experience, awful. It was a grueling reminder that the Romans were occupiers in this land and that they had the authority and the right to tell the Jewish people to do whatever they wanted them to do and there was no other way to deal with it. It would be like a Jewish person in more modern days. 70, 80, 90 years ago, in Germany, in Poland, having that Nazi armed guard, that SS officer, stride into their nice home and say, this is our new headquarters. But sir, this is, shut up, out. That would be what it would be like. You have no power to push back. It's a bad thing. In fact, it would be easy for that to become Simon's identity. Oppressed, victimized, both of which are true. But the puzzle pieces, the indications are that Simon came to a different identity. And that identity could be described with two words, in Christ. In Christ. It's quite easy for bad experience, difficult moments to become our identity. Martin Luther refused to allow that. The year 1527 was a brutal year in the life of Luther. When you read it described, it's almost enough to make your head hurt. The way he describes going through times when he had dizzy spells, fainting spells, where he was overwhelmed, he couldn't move, he cried out for somebody to bring him water, please, I'm in profound suffering. Today we would probably say he's clinically depressed. He's having to face the realities of not wanting to leave his church, but being pushed out because of the convictions he has arrived at through Scripture. In fact, there was a week in that year that he described as living in the pit of hell and death. That was also the year that Luther penned a song. It's one we still sing. It's one I'm waiting for us to get back into the sanctuary to sing so, so that the organ comes underneath it, the, the, the brass and the, and the orchestra play, the choir sings, because it's one of those grand songs of the faith. 
a mighty fortress is our God. Luther penned those words in that dark year, that awful experience. And though the world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God is still His peace to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we shall endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That's the reality. Don't assume a bad experience is your destiny. Those three take-home messages are nudged toward us by Simon of Cyrene. From what we can put together of the pieces of his story, Simon's story challenges us not to make assumptions. Don't assume that happenstance is merely happenstance. Don't assume that an involuntary cross is the worst thing. Don't assume that a bad experience is your identity. Why? Because Jesus gets a hold of us. He transforms us. He changes us. He lifts us by the power of His cross. So that's our take-home message for today. Christ's cross can transform involuntary happenstance into destiny.